Good morning. good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to Lake Grove Presbyterian Church. It is good to be together. We're partnering with Christ who transforms the world one life at a time. And we're kicking off the new program year together. So grateful for all of you who are here in person in the sanctuary. Grateful for those of you who are watching us online at, at, in whatever medium. And welcome to the choir back. As I share, as I prepare to share uh, a few announcements about what's going on in the life of our church, I hope you'll take those friendship pads that are along that middle aisle and uh, sign in, pass them on down. Some of you have already done that. That's great. And if you're watching online, if you're on our website, you can do that. Find that little box that says friendship pad, sign in. And even if you're watching on Vimeo or YouTube, you know, just send us an email and say, I was there, info at lakegroveprez.org. Wherever and whenever you're with us, you are very welcome. We're glad to have you here. You know, before the actual announcements, uh, it is worth our time to mark some important dates together, perhaps. Of course, 21 years ago on this date, terrorism changed or added a new dimension to uh, uh, what's going on in our world, not just for the United States, but for all around the globe. And I remember walking into church that Tuesday morning. It was my second week here at Lake Grove. And there was a fuzzy television. Some of the staff were hanging around there. And Pastor Bob looked at us and said, our world changed today. And it did, didn't it? Still impacted by that. And, um, but we are still here. And uh, we remember the victims, we deplore terrorism in all its forms, and we are committed to the ways of the Prince of Peace, our Lord Jesus Christ. In another way, the world changed for our friends of the United Kingdom this past week, of course, and we recognize it, 70 years reign. You know, some of us haven't lived that long. She's always been queen. So we mourn that loss as well. And then on a happier note, yesterday was September 10th. It was the 98th birthday of Lake Grove Presbyterian Church. And we're grateful for that. So, and TJ, TJ, you're looking very good for 98 years, you know, I think. So two years, we're going to be celebrating our 
Centennial, right? Will you be there? Yes. Okay, I will too. That's great. So, um, uh, you notice in your bulletin you have that handout that tells you a number of things that are happening in the life of the church in the next few weeks. That's great. After church today, we'll be celebrating today's launch of the program year right out there in the courtyard with the Jesus statue and the play structure. There'll be special music, Italian sodas, popcorn. Uh, There's a a, a photo booth there. Uh, It's just going to be lots of fun for all ages. And so that'll be right after church following the closing organ piece. (laughs) Next Sunday, September 18th, after church, actually at 11 a.m., so after fellowship, our Agros um, Go team that went to Guatemala is going to present highlights from their time there in July. And if you remember, we commis- when we commissioned them, uh, we, s- we promised that we would listen to their stories about what God was doing when they came back. So this is our chance to do that. I understand they'll be serving Guatemalan coffee and also, I think it's cajeta, which is uh, caramel sauce made from goat's milk. Uh, so that'll be fun. I hope to see you there. And lastly, you've heard us say from time to time that we have choirs for people from the age of 4 to 104. Singing is really a great way to serve in church, and it's a great way to get connected. And we have some great musicians leading you in our choirs. So rehearsals for the fall season have just started up. This is the time, perfect time to join. Today we're going to see a little video message to tell us a little bit more about what it means to sing in the choir. So let's watch that. Here at Lake Grove, we offer choirs for all ages, from 4 to 104. Our Joy, Hope, and Peace choirs offer a supportive community where children and youth can explore making music with their own voices and join their voices together to glorify God. Our Sanctuary Choir welcomes singers of all levels and leads the congregation in worship at the 930 Sanctuary Service. The choir frequently ministers outside the walls of our building, whether through service projects with local mission partners, community outreach concerts, or encouraging and supporting one another through hard times. Our choir is like a family. We pray for each other. We encourage each other and support each other. We have gone through hard times with choir members and we celebrate the the joys as well as those hard times. One example of why this is a choir family is kind of personal for me. I was diagnosed with cancer and had to be in the hospital twice and uh, each choir member at that point there was a picture taken and they had something on it like a word of encouragement and I wallpapered one whole wall of my room in the hospital with those pictures. And if I was moved to a different room, which I was, all the pictures came with me. And what a great testimony to the choir and their love of fellow choir members. So I guess somebody asked me what made me interested in joining the choir. And I think, why not? I mean, I love to sing. But to be part of that, you, you know, when the choir is up there, they just look like they're just having such a wonderful time. They, the, the look on their faces, the joy that comes out of their, their faces is just amazing. And, and to be part of that, to be experiencing that joy and sharing that with the congregation and with those that we sing to. So I think joining the choir was just kind of a thing where it, it was a foregone conclusion that I was, I had to join the choir. I have so many memories of what we've been singing in the choir. The singing of Dan Forrest's Jubilate Deo. That was in 2019. We did it for our concert series in June. It was a piece that had music in many different languages. And it was just really an inspiring and moving moment for me. We welcome all new singers to join our ranks. If you would like to learn more about our choirs, we invite you to email us at music at lakegroveprez.org. Remember, your voice is God's gift to you, and using your voice is your gift to God.
Our music team will be right out here in the gathering area after church to answer any questions you have and or to sign you up if you feel like you're ready now. And uh, they have some homemade cookies out there too. So even if you don't sign up, go get a cookie. <laughs> and now it's my pleasure to introduce one of our congregation's strongest families to lead us in the call to worship. It's the Strong family, including the Bartlett's. And as they come up, I invite you to find your call to worship in your worship guide there and stand. And we'll do the call to worship together. Remembering 9-11, we proclaim that God so loves this world. In this world, people hunger and thirst. Then come worship God, who feeds the hungry. In this world, people are abused and oppressed. Then come worship God, who calls for compassion and justice. In this world, there are wars and rumors of wars. Then come worship God, who champions peace. Then come worship God, who gives life rich meaning. We worship our holy God. Amen. Yes, O oh God, we worship you in all your fullness, creator, redeemer, and spirit sustainer. We're here once again to praise you, to hear you, to love you, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, please receive and even enhance our worship. Strengthen us, guide us, that we may leave here knowing we've been in your presence and that we are ready to face the coming week with you. Hallelujah and amen. amen. And please be seated.
so many places in need of God's mercy in the world these days. I guess it's always been that way. And now we take time to ask God's mercy on us. So we adopt an attitude of repentance as we enter a time of honest confession. It's more about our hearts than our words. The Holy Spirit will interpret your thoughts and feelings as you seek God's forgiveness and cleansing. Uh, So I'll start our prayer and I'll give you some time, some silence that you can fill in the blanks for your own life. Let's pray together. Have mercy on us, O God, for we fall short of the glory to which we aspire as creatures made in the image of our Creator. You call us to proclaim the gospel, but too often we tolerate the presence of evil. You call us to be reconciled to you and to one another, but we are content to live in separation. You call us to seek the good of all, but we align ourselves with our special interests and demonize those who think differently. You call us to fight oppression and injustice, but too often we are complacent, endangering the well-being of people far and near. Please forgive us, Lord, and reconcile us to yourself by the power of your Spirit. And now please hear our private, personalized confession in these moments of silence. Thank you for hearing our prayers, and we offer them in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you now to stand for these words of assurance that come from the apostles Peter and Paul. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. So I declare to you in the name of Jesus that we are forgiven and we are made new. And we're going to remain standing to sing a joyful response. You'll notice we have a new one today. So let's pay attention as we sing together. Forgiven in Christ, we are now at peace with God. And we're going to share that peace with each other in just a moment. I ask you to do that in appropriate ways, uh, given the time we live in. And then we'll remain standing to sing uh, our next hymn afterwards. But now, the peace of Christ be with all of you. Let's share the peace with one another.
please have a seat. And let's pray together. Oh, gracious God, we open up our hearts to you now, asking you for your mercy to res- receive our respective prayers and to act upon them in keeping with your eternal will, for we know we need you, we know we are dependent upon you, uh, whether, we, whether it seems like it or not, we are interdependent on each other and as members of your body here in our reality, may we be there for one another and for anyone in need of help or just of fellowship. There's so many things we could lay before you right now, Lord, and you are aware of all of them. Please help us not to be overwhelmed by all the news and information that comes to us through various media, but keep us persistent in prayer for the things you lay upon our hearts, our close friends and family, our brothers and sisters in Christ here and across the globe, our communities, our nation, and our world. Today we mentioned just a few things out loud. The continued aggression in Ukraine seems to be the war we currently hear most about, but there are many wars in the world, long, ongoing civil wars, terrorist insurgencies, drug wars, even culture wars, political fighting. Lord, have mercy and help us to find resolution to our conflicts, thwart the wicked, and strengthen the righteous. Wildfires, Lord, the smoke and haziness and colors of filtered sunlight yesterday almost were triggers for us, reminding of the fire season two years ago. We thank you for firefighters, and we ask you to protect them. Look with favor on our efforts to protect human life as well as property and infrastructure and help us to be wise stewards of the natural resources you've given us. Please protect us and help us to minimize the damage. We ask for your comforting grace, Lord, on those who are grieving loss. uh, We think of the people of the UK who have lost the queen they had for so long. We ask your blessing on widows and widowers among us, other family members who are missing loved ones. We ask your blessing on those who are sick or injured, going through therapy and rehab. Please strengthen these folks. Give them patience. Others are frustrated with broken relationships. Some just feel alone. We need your presence, Lord. Some among us feel the challenge of aging, seeming to spend more and more time just to stay healthy and upright. Some of us struggle with dementia or loved ones with dementia. Others face the challenge of other forms of chronic mental disorders. Lord, come alongside us. Be our solid rock that we may cope and overcome our respective challenges. In all our experiences, Lord, whether glorious or ominous, we're glad to be part of your eternal, diverse family made up of people of all cultures, all colors, And we join them in the family prayer Jesus taught us now, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, isn't it wonderful to have the choir back with us? Isn't it? <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> you know, um, I do have to start the sermon to, to uh, acknowledging the Queen's passing and also acknowledging today, 21 years ago, uh, 9-11, in the midst of just the the new and old grief. I came across a quote I'd love to share with you. Uh, This came from uh, David Levithan, author. He writes this. What separates us from the animals, what separates us from the chaos, is our ability to mourn people we've never met. So today we mourn. 
At the same time, we recognize that uh, yesterday, as you, I'm sure you mentioned, yesterday was our birthday as a church, 98 years old. And you guys look great. So uh, anyway, so that's good. We're, we're, uh, today's launch Sunday as we launch into a whole new year of ministries and programs. And we're actually launching into a full year of sermons going through the book of Luke. Now, we're going to break, break for Advent and break for Lent, and, uh, but we'll, we're going to do a whole year through the book of Luke, and we're calling that, that you may know the truth, Jesus through a healer's eyes. I mean, you may know that it's, Luke was a physician. But now, this first series that we're entering into now, this is just the first series, the first, uh, this first series within this year of Luke covers the period uh, from the very uh, first few chapters of Luke, it covers the period uh, that leads up to, but doesn't include, Jesus' public ministry. So this is the backstory, that Jesus story that's under the radar uh, at first. And so this is that backstory. Hence, our series title is called Firm Foundation, the Origin Story of Jesus. And I also want to mention, I hopefully you saw that in the All Church email when it came out, but if you clicked on that link, there's a really great video introducing this sermon series. I encourage you to click it and watch it, but then take that link and forward it to friends to invite them as well. It's a great way to have them jump in to this, what I think is a very exciting sermon series. Uh, but with that, we're going to take a look at this first chapter of Luke, actually the first few verses of Luke, it's the prologue. And before we do that, let's pray that God would illuminate his word to our lives. Lord God, we thank you for this word, and we thank you that you are a God of your word. And we pray that in this time, as we look into your word, that we are getting a glimpse of who you are and who we are, that we might be transformed through the Holy Spirit as it accompanies this word. And so we thank you, Lord God, for being with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Luke starts the gospel in this way. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who, from the beginning, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So do you have a favorite superhero? No, I don't mean your mom or Abraham Lincoln. I mean somebody with superpowers, a favorite superhero. If you were a kid growing up following superheroes, no doubt you knew that superhero's backstory. Where did he come from? How did he become the way he is? You know, when I was a little kid, this is way, way back in the recesses of my memory, so I'm sure I was really tiny. Uh, I remember watching a superhero cartoon in which a guy accidentally swallowed a magic glowing rock and it gave him superpowers. And I wanted that to be my origin story. So as a little kid, I went around looking for glowing rocks to swallow. I never found one, as you can tell. But then later, after that, I graduated to Aquaman. But then I was confused. You see, his origin story changed three times over the decades. The first version, his father discovered Atlantis and taught this young Aquaman the secret of underwater breathing. And then a few decades later, that origin story changed, saying his mother was a water-breathing nymph who gave him aqua powers. And then, years after that, the, the backstory, the origin story changed a third time, saying that Aquaman was born from a wizard and queen of Atlantis. Which origin story was right? I wanted to know, because I wanted to adopt that origin story so I could be a superhero. Well, then, then there is Spider-Man. 
How many Spider-Man origin story movies are there? I wanted to know which origin story I could trust so that I could be a superhero. How can I find a glowing magical rock to swallow? How can I learn the secrets of breathing underwater? How can I get a radioactive spider to bite me? <laughs> I wanted that origin story to be my story. I wanted a true superhero origin story to be mine. Well, in reality, we actually all do have an origin story explaining who we are. We rehearse that origin story all the time. When we meet somebody, we tell them who we are, where we've come from, how we are the way we are. But we need a solid origin story to build on, especially these days. The ground is shifting under our feet. You heard it in our prayers. The Ukraine war is entering a new phase of fighting. Wildfires are, are coloring our skies. The Queen of England has passed. Today is 9-11, when everything came crashing down. We want to build on certainty. We need solid ground. We need a, a true story, knowing there really is a superhero who can save us. Is that Jesus Christ? Is Jesus' origin story a firm foundation for our story? Or is it superhero fiction? This question is why Luke wrote this gospel. Luke was an academic, he was a researcher, he was a physician, and he was a, a person of culture who was a companion of the Apostle Paul. As a matter of fact, these days, if he was alive, these days, uh, Luke would have uh, uh, an MD and a PhD. He'd be a doctor twice over. Dr. Luke, unlike Paul, was among the first non-Jewish Christians. He was well-to-do, brainy, articulate, discerning, just the facts kind of guy. In other words, Luke would be Presbyterian. <laughs> At least I like to think so. Luke wrote this prologue in a real academic style. The academic style of the time, historical and, and medical works were written this way as well. He wrote this in a style by creating a researched account. You, we just read this together, you heard it. A researched account of the unbelievable reports about Jesus. People wanted to know his true origin story. Where did Jesus come from? How did he become the way he is? And so Dr. Luke provides that story. Specifically, for Theophilus, who apparently asked for it. Theophilus is a Greek name, meaning friend of God. Now, you may figure that out, because the first part of that word is theo. Theo means God in Greek. And the last part comes from the Greek word philia, which is a love. It means a friendship love. You may know that from Philadelphia, right? Philia is a friendship love, and delphoi means brother. And so Philadelphia means brotherly love. So here we have Theophilia, Theophilus, meaning a friend, a loving friend of God. Wouldn't you love to be known as a friend of God? Well, this Theophilus, not an uncommon name, but this Theophilus, we know, was a person of distinction, likely an influential Roman governor of Judea, who was, he was actually, of all things, he was an outsider to the church, but had a critical interest in Jesus. Theophilus had questions. Theophilus wanted the truth. Theophilus wanted Christianity explained. Theophilus wanted Jesus' origin story. Is that you? Are you a friend of God with questions? Who is Jesus? How did he become savior of the world? Can Jesus' origin story be a firm foundation for our story or is this just superhero fiction? Is this just a, a, a positive spin 
on a tragic execution story. Speaking of positive spin, trying to make bad things sound good, I think about a woman who walked into a doctor's office looking for a firm foundation. When she met the doctor, she described all of her symptoms and they were unlike anything he had ever heard before. So the doctor ran a few tests and stepped out of the room. And then he, when he returned, he said, I have some good news and some bad news. And the woman said, well, I'll hear the good news first, please. So the doctor said, well, the good news is we're naming a new disease after you. <laughs> Friends, that is not good news. That is just positive spin on a bad news. I mean, is this, is this what's happening with Jesus? Is this just a, a positive spin on bad news of a terrible crucifixion? positive spin on a bad situation doesn't fix it. No, that is not a firm foundation. That is just superhero fiction. Which is why Dr. Luke provides not a positive spin on a tragic story, but facts. MDiv, PhD, facts. He, he researches the truth using eyewitnesses, testimonials, evidential proofs, and civic records of the time. As a matter of fact, he does that so much so that some Christians actually criticize Luke for relying on evidential certainty way too much. They criticize Luke for abandoning a faith-based belief in favor of a fact-based belief. However, as we start to go through this book of Luke, we'll see that Luke has a very real faith. So, why did he engage in investigative research? Well, because Luke was convinced these events not only changed lives, but changed the course of history and the world. So rather than positive spin, Luke provides a solid word. Asphalea. Asphalea. See, verse 4 says he's writing this whole book of this whole gospel. He's writing this that we may know the truth. Asphalea. Say that word with me. Asphalea. Asphalea, of course, he, Luke wrote this in Greek. Asphalea um, is translated here as truth, but asphalea is not the typical word for truth in, in Greek. As a matter of fact, the typical word for truth is aletheia. You may know that one, aletheia or aletheia. So the question is, why did Luke not use that word? Why did Luke use the word asphalea? Well, you see, asphalea literally means security, assurance, certainty, solidness. As a matter of fact, we use the word asphalea in English. See, believe it or not, asphalea gives us the word asphalt, solid, concrete, asphalt. That's what he's doing. Uh, uh, so verse 4 isn't about some uh, philosophical truth. No, asphalea. It's about a rock-solid, empirically researched certainty that we can build on. Asphalea, certain, secure, firm foundation. See, he's saying in verse 4, he's writing this so that we would know the concrete reliability of Jesus' story. You see, Jesus' origin story is a firm foundation for your story. Asphalea. So, when the world comes crashing down, how can we know Jesus' origin story is a firm foundation for our story rather than superhero fiction? Well, the morning of September 12, 2001, Father Lyndon Harris, a priest at St. Paul's Chapel in New York City made his way to the church to sift through the catastrophic rubble. 
The millions of tons of the, the World Trade Center buildings crashing down was the equivalent, according to a, a Stanford scientist, it was the equivalent of a nuclear bomb detonating. Buildings blocks away were ruined. And St. Paul's Chapel sat directly across the street. Picking through the debris along the way there, Lyndon could only imagine the mayhem he would find when he arrived. What, if anything, remained standing? But what he faced was a greater shock than he imagined. When Lyndon arrived, yes, he saw wreckage covering the property, except, to his astonishment, the church itself was untouched. Not a single pane of glass was broken. Impossible. But what happened next was an even greater grace. St. Paul's Chapel became solid ground as thousands and thousands of rescue workers, police and firefighters, hungry and weary, weighed down with gear, wearing boots half melted from the fiery ash, fell into that church's embrace, finding food and rest. Don't you see? God created a miraculous, real-life parable for all to see. When I was in New York City just a couple months ago in July, I walked by that parable many times. The, this real parable spoke to me and to all passing by. Amid a world crashing down, this real parable showed the world there is a firm foundation. The asphalea certainty of Jesus Christ, the savior of the world, on whose story is solid ground. Friends, it's not superhero fiction. Truly thousands experienced it together, for real. So, how can we know Jesus' origin story isn't just superhero fiction? By experiencing it together, for real. I strongly encourage you to join one of our Luke small groups and experience it with us through a small group. Continue coming to worship each week with us as we walk through uh, the, this book of Luke together, learning Jesus' origin story. Let's build our story on asphalea certainty, not on superhero fiction. That's what Luke offers us here. Jesus' origin story is a firm foundation for your story. You see, his amazing superhero origin story can become part of your story, and you don't have to swallow glowing rocks or get bitten by radioactive spiders to get it. This is a real gospel for real people with real questions like Theophilus. In the weeks ahead, you'll see Jesus' origin story is a firm foundation for your story. And so, my dear Theophiluses, my dear friends of God, embrace the real origin story of Jesus. It'll make your story more exciting, more fulfilling, and more solid than ever before. Asphalea. That's because he will give you a firm foundation. Amen.
Lord, thank you for providing for us. You are generous to us. You give us enough that we can pass it on. And so we do today, asking you to receive our gifts in the name of Jesus for your purposes in a world that needs him so much. So whether we give right now in the plate or have given in other ways, electronically and so on, we ask you to receive and multiply these gifts for his sake. And today we single out two of our mission partners far away in the Middle East. We pray for David and Jennifer Williams as they minister to Syrian refugees. We ask you to bless them with physical health and stamina. We also pray closer to home, right downtown Portland, for the Portland Rescue Mission in their service to the hungry and houseless as they share God's love in message and ministry. For these and all our mission partners, we thank you, and we thank you for what you are doing right here within these walls as well. For the sake of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. And please have a seat. the land's dark roots in the farthest deep where the daylight dims where no one can reach can the hand of God can the voice of Find me even here, find me even
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all as we build our story on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, both now and forevermore. And all God's people shouted, Amen. Amen.